So I want to set up this panel a little bit. Um, the purpose of this panel is to give uh, the audience kind of a view of the practical application and the historical uh, uh, perspective of the application of big networks and big data applications in North Carolina. Um, and each, each speaker will bring a unique perspective to this. So I'll give you two seconds on, on the perspective and um, as I introduce each speaker. And I'm just going to go name and title. Um, I think a lot of folks in the audience know the panel as well. So Henry Schaefer is Professor Emeritus of Genetics and Biomathematics at NC State University. He's also coordinator of special IT projects, and he's faculty collaborator. Uh, I'm supposed to do uh, outreach to the faculty from the information technology side. You're perfect for that. <laughs> uh, Tracy Futhi is the CIO at Duke University and a, uh, uh, a great supporter of MCNC who has been involved in the national networking, research networking um, scene since her days as a student and CIO at Carnegie Mellon. So, uh, uh, Tracy, we're, we're, uh, we're pleased to have you. Tracy's going to talk a little bit about specific projects of which Duke's engaged and how North Carolina uh, leverages the national, national networking research. But Tracy's also going to talk a little bit about um, some views of the future, I think, uh, and she has a great perspective of that. Um, Dr. Elia Baldin is senior networking researcher at RENSI. Um, the, uh, RENSI uh, is, as, as all of you know, our research organization for network-based research and topical research in key areas. And Ilya will talk about some of the projects that they're involved in, but also some of his personal uh, network research. Uh, uh, he scares me every time he comes to MCNC, telling me that he's getting to the cartridge capacity of fiber quickly. So uh, uh, I'm hoping that, uh, hoping that doesn't happen for a while um, now that we've invested all this. And then John Moore is our Senior Director of Advanced Initiatives at MCNC. John, former IBM employee, and has been with us uh, at an NC State and has been with us for a number of years and really looks to the future for us on the experimental edge and, and, and what we do. So um, with that kind of setup, I am going to let Henry start and just talk about some of his historical perspective and what he's involved in today. Henry. Well. It's been, it's been absolutely fabulous to hear everybody and so many of the themes that uh, I hear we're going on towards uh, have echoes from the past. Uh, one, of the th one of the things that was mentioned today, uh, one of our speakers talked about, it takes a village and I would like to expand. No, it takes a community, not just one village and that's the aspect of networking. Um, and in our case, the community includes all of the UNC universities not the, and the private universities, not just the Triangle universities, which of course were uh, in a position to provide leadership. It took the, the state government of North Carolina. It took MCNC. Uh, I couldn't bring PowerPoints, I was told, so I'm bringing a few exhibits. <laughs> That, that was me in the early networking days. MCN, this is red, MCNC bang, NCECS bang, HES. I'm HES, those were my initials, and in those days we used our initials. There weren't many people in the network, so there was no overlap on initials. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but I want you to see the distribution point of Usenet in that era was MCNC. Uh, uh, those people who remember back to news groups, that software was written by graduate students at UNC Chapel Hill and at Duke. And that was the start of everything that you now know from Google, <coughs> from Yahoo, and so on, came out of there. Uh, the next step, you want, to, you want me to hold your uh, slide? <laughs> <laughs> was BitNet. That's me in the BitNet days. Yeah. BitNet. Wh what does that stand for? Well, the rumor was it stands for BIT because it's there. Uh, I'm certain that's not the official one, but that's the one I believe in. And it was using BitNet that I was able to engage with Glenn, and we met down here in Research Triangle Park. 
And uh, we ended up working with other states. But the big thing is we looked ahead in that community. And Glenn, who was the, uh, what should I say, the true visionary, uh, Morty Tarragon, he was at UMD College Park, Morty Tarragon, George Washington University, myself here. I'm from NC State, but I was working in a tuck environment, which also included NCECS, which I mentioned a minute ago, which included a consortium of publics and privates, basically anyone who could connect. And we generated a proposal, the regional network concept. NSFNet was very restricted. CERNet went to the NSFNet and said, what are you doing? You should have a network for every scholar in every discipline. And at, with an unsolicited proposal. And NSF took it in, said, oh my goodness, we have missed something. They started a new request for proposals and dumped our proposal in. So now it was a requested proposal. And they made the award. And Surinet, regional network, uh, Maryland, Delaware, down two states thick along the Atlantic, including Puerto Rico. And we had a network called Surinet, Southeastern University's Research Association. Uh, we were the first one. We certainly were the first one, NISERNet, is tied with us. Uh, they, 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 did a, they did a good job. It was the same concept. The time was right. We started it with Glenn's leadership and convinced the NSF to move. And so, next slide. <laughs> NSFnet, Surinet, the internet. Surinet not only had the idea of any scholar in any discipline, but also commercial entities. They can't be supported by NSF. That would be illegal. So Sura <coughs> simply said, good, you won't be supported by NSF. And we changed our accounting. So everybody was billed full freight. But the universities had a line on their invoice saying, minus NSF contribution, balance to be paid, zero. And then later, as we made a transition, balance to be paid 50% of your bill. Balance to be paid 75% of your bill because we got into a sustainable, self-supporting network. I talked about the community. You need to reach the community. We, have, we had one interchange point or one necking point in each state. So what do we do in North <coughs> Carolina? How could you get past RTP? And now, can everyone see the pink NC? Concert was the original name. Now it's NC Ren. Someone bought the concert name. They liked it so much. It helped the bottom line. <laughs> and, and the point is, and this is what you've heard so much about today, was the outreach, the outreach throughout North Carolina. I was just tickled, Joe, to hear you, and we didn't coordinate this, to hear you mention Edgecombe County School District, Edgecombe County Public Schools. Uh, I am working on a project where we're trying to improve math learning <coughs> outcomes in those high schools using <coughs> delivery, using software and one-to-one -one laptop that Myra mentioned. And that's part of the picture. Edgecombe County is a rural school, underserved school district. But they're better off than Greene County, which is their neighbor. And the bringing internet connectivity to these counties is opening up possibilities. And I would like to just close uh, by mentioning Metcalf's Law, which was stated a lot in the old days. I don't know if anyone talks about it anymore because it's so obvious. It says the value of a network grows not just as fast as how many people are connected. It grows as the square of that number. The value of the network 
And what we're seeing here today is the possible further expansion of the network and the value continues to go up faster than before.